Hey, it's Gerald from Lakers Fast Break. Anchor is the easiest way to make your next podcast. It's absolutely free, and their creation tools will allow you to record and edit your show right from your phone or your home computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on great podcast outlets like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started on your next podcast. We're back for another episode of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here from Lakers Fast Break, Pop Culture Cosmos, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and Game Source. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Or if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, whatever you can do to help us out, it is truly appreciated. Well, another great day in the NBA, day seven already in the first round of the playoffs has gone by, and there were some interesting finishes, to say the least, and here today to talk to me about those finishes and some teams going home and some teams very much in the thick of things is my good friend. You got to check out what he's doing today at NBA Draft Junkies, including his awesome, awesome mock video, mock draft videos that he did, not only with all of us together in a mock draft on his page, NBA Draft Junkies on YouTube, but also as well, check out his podcast, including his latest self mock draft. And also as well, you got to go ahead and check out Run the Floor podcast. So that's the NBA Draft Junkies podcast and the Run the Floor podcast, available everywhere you get your podcasts. It is my good friend, the man Knee Deep in draft prospects right now it is rafael barlow and rafael you survived our group mock draft yeah it was fun i i had the double duty of picking for three teams and being adam silver at the same time and the the ping pong balls uh but it was it was fun i mean good group of guys very knowledgeable and um like you had mentioned off the air it went by pretty fast. I mean, everybody kind of knew their, you know, they just knew their stuff. So yeah. it didn't take a long time and it just kind of went like rapid fire. So I don't even think it was an hour, it may have been like 45 yeah. minutes or something like that. Just under that for, actually. Yeah. For 30 picks. So I thought it went well and looking forward to doing a, a second round. I would like to do a second round and also as well, a mock draft Combined between both of us, 4.0 group mock draft. I would love to get everybody back for uh, another round of that. Not only, like you said, with the second round, but also as well at group. And that one, if we do a final one just before the draft itself or a 4.0, I want to do full two rounds that time. That sounds good to you. Okay. Yeah, my dream scenario would be 30 guys. Every guy represents a team. So some guys may pick twice. Some guys may be done after one. It may be kind of boring in a sense because if you are, I don't know, just off the top of my head, if you're like the Warriors and only have one pick, then you could be done after in the first five minutes. So, um, but yeah, that would be like my dream scenario to kind of make it as realistic as possible. You could do get 30 people, maybe pick the 30 picks and then do the 30, you know. Yeah, 30 people, like, you know, just kind of give everybody a team. Then, uh, I don't know, something like, it's probably take a lot of time and effort, but something super realistic where we have, uh, you know, we can make trades and whether or not it matches up on the cap, we'd have to figure that out. But I, I would love to do something like that. I tried to make a trade with Mikey V today, but no, no dice, my friend, no dice. Yeah, didn't quite work. Rui Hashimura and a number nine pick didn't work for me. 
But <laughs> we should try that sometime. That would take a Zoom call, I would imagine, because StreamYard only goes up to 10. Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to do it live, I don't think, as far as putting it on on uh, on YouTube Live. But it would be fun. It would be like, you know, like the, when they have the fantasy football uh, trades or, or, or whatever, just – we probably have to have like a, a, I don't know, use ESPN's trade machine, see if it works out. Yep. That would be a dream scenario to 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 make that happen, but it would probably take a lot of work and and enough guys to really uh, want to get involved. But I think it could do really big numbers. Uh, it could do really big numbers. It'd be very interesting to see. The only thing is you'd have to get 30 people to commit to that, and that would be the big issue because we could barely get 10 for this draft. Yeah. Well, we had about probably 12 or 13 committed and then part of it is my fault um you know when you sent me the the time i saw 12 and i didn't pay attention to it so i told guys 12 and then once i got back to them so i'm sorry it's just actually at two a couple guys couldn't make it or they wanted to push it back to another time we had a couple guys so they couldn't do it then they were able to get whatever they had going freed up so they could do it but overall i think it was a, a success <laughs> And I'm waiting until hopefully tomorrow, by the time this podcast airs, it will be up on YouTube. I think it's up now, but I can't. I don't know. The whole StreamYard thing is, is weird. Like, I can't really edit it or or even, like, change the thumbnail. So I'm yeah. looking forward to that so I can change the thumbnail and create a better graphic. Welcome to my life and why I went ahead to not only stream on YouTube, but also went to Facebook Live. So... That's, okay. that's the thing. That, that's the main reason why, so I could put things out a lot sooner. But I will tell you, my friend, it was a lot of fun. Uh, again, you deserve all the kudos to do what you did on it. I, you had a lot of, on your plate taking care of everybody as far as the draft order and making sure everything was flowing well and trying to read the commenters, hating all of our picks, except for Kuzi. Uh, <laughs> well, Kuzi actually got a couple little uh, dissenting votes, but for the most part, still... He gets the most love, and uh, I know for the Lakers fans, if you want to check out what I picked, and also Laker Tom's comments, to me, you want to go ahead and check that out. It's on Lakerholics.com. It's all right there for you, the mock draft, uh, right there on the on the site. Just go ahead, and you can also check out who I voted for and what Laker Tom thinks of my picks. And, of course, you know, it's Laker Tom. But it was a great day in the NBA, my friend, for quite a few different reasons. And I think you and I both want to know, or actually we, we both know where we're going to start first with this, and that is with Dallas and the Clippers. My goodness. Just think, if Porzingis hadn't have been thrown out of that game, we would be looking at a 3-1 to one lead, or quite possibly a 3-1 to one lead for the Dallas Mavericks. Yeah, it's uh, ooh, that Clippers locker room. I would not want to be in that locker room. I think that they were one of the teams that a lot of people predicted would have an easy first round matchup. Not well, I shouldn't say easy first round matchup, but they were predicted to win by probably ninety five percent of the people that were, you know, making predictions. And those five percent were probably in Dallas or Slovenia. Yes. So. I think everybody thought this was a Clippers, you know, shoe in that they could probably win in five games, six games max, but they've they've been exposed. And I mean it's still a few games left. But if I'm Dallas, I have to be super confident going into going into the next game. And if I'm LA, I'm concerned. Is Paul George going to get it going? Is he hurt? Um you know, where's their defense? Like, they were supposed to be one of the better defensive teams. Where's Patrick and, Beverly? Yeah, I um, yeah, I mean, I think he helped some, but I also feel like he would probably hurt them more than he would help them because, um, you know, if I think the Mavericks game plan would be for him to just attack Luca or Luca for Luca to attack him because he's just too big. And, you know, in game one, he was just, when he got Beverly on, he was just shedding him, just driving right through him. And then when the Clippers have the ball on offense, I think the Mavs can rest Luka. 
and have him just kind of guard Beverly, who's just kind of standing in the corner. So I think Beverly actually helps the Mavs out as opposed to really helping the Clippers. What an exciting game it was, my friend. It did go to overtime, and on a Luka Doncic three in the last second to win the game, well, I mean, what an incredible start to his playoff career this is. The Dallas Mavericks beat the LA Clippers, coming from, I think, at least 22 points down in the first like half. That, yeah. yep. Without Christoph Porzingis. They win 135 to 133. And the major question I have for you is, because again, as content creators 805 put it, you've got that laser focus and that great wisdom of yours. So I want to hear your thoughts on this in your infinite wisdom. Why was Reggie Jackson guarding Luka Doncic on that, on that last shot when you have both Paul George and Kawhi on the floor as your primary defenders, quote unquote, on the floor at the same time. I think they might have ran from the moment. I really do. I don't I don't think that was the game plan. Well you I'd know where the ball's gonna it. go, right? Yeah, yeah. I just think like on the switch, there wasn't the effort made on the switch to you know, to fight through it. I don't know why Reggie Jackson was even on the floor. I mean it's the last shot. You don't necessarily need a point guard out there, really. I would have put maybe Jermichael Green out there. Taller. So if I had Green on, I don't know, let's say Hardaway or Curry, then that way, even if they did switch, you still have a plus defender. And, yeah, I just don't understand why Reggie Jackson was on the floor because even during the game when it was in crunch time, I felt like the Mavs were targeting him on defense anyway. You know, they were running screens so they can get him matched up against Doncic. And, I mean, it's just a great play by Luka. I I was texting a friend of mine who lives in Germany who pays attention to EuroLeague basketball a lot. And I was like, uh, yeah, we saw Real Madrid Luka this time because he's I – mean, he had a lot of big clutch shots in Europe. And remember, and he was them, iffy for the game in the first place with that bad ankle. Yeah, I mean, if you would have gambled and who, who was not going to play, you would have thought Luca was out, Porzingis would play. So I was shocked to see that that last-minute scratch. But he's a gamer. And, I mean, I've been saying it for years now. I'm starting to look like a genius. But we are really watching a real-life prodigy in real time. He, I mean, the stuff that tremendous. he's done. And, like, I, I tweeted the jump – the jumps that he keeps making, and and I probably said it before on one of your shows, 2016-17, he was a part-time starter for Real Madrid. Very good team. They went to the Final Four, and he didn't have a real impact in big games. Somehow, some way, during Eurobasket that year, he made this jump where he pretty much carried Slovenia to Eurobasket. I was lucky, lucky enough to be there and watch that live. Then the next year, he just goes from MVP. And so for the people that are listening, I'm trying to think of a comparison. There is one. It would one. be like, but just comparison from being, I don't know. A Not guy, very much of one. I mean, maybe like Kawhi, but Kawhi yeah. did that in the NBA. Yeah. And I'm just thinking of jump, like who was, so it would be maybe like a guy that was a, a solid role player on a team last year. I, I don't know. I can't think of one. But a guy, imagine a guy being a solid role player who you think is good, but he's a partial starter on a, one of the top four teams in the league. And then the next year, he wins MVP and leads the league, you know, a team to a championship. So imagine, all right, let's just say Siakam's jump, yeah. maybe somewhat similar, but he still wasn't like – the A1, the, the number one option that led his team to the championship. Uh, you know, it's, it's not out of the question this year, but that's kind of like the jump Luca made. And then from, you know, his year he won MVP and, and the championship in Europe, he came to the NBA and had a phenomenal rookie year, arguably one of the best rookie years that we've ever seen, especially from a teenager. 
But then the jump he made this year, it was like 29, 9, and 9. And then he's made another jump here in the the restart. I mean, he's had like some video game numbers, 40-point triple doubles. You know, I think he had a 19-rebound game, a 20-assist game. Yeah, and like I said, I went on a tangent there, but we're watching a real-life prodigy in real time. It's, It's happening right before our eyes. And it just seems like there's just... You think you can stop him. You think you can put a defense out there that can stop him. But again, he is faster than you're thinking. He's more athletic and more shifty than you than you realize. And he can find his way to the basket no matter who is put in front of him. I've seen him. I've seen Kawhi guard him. I've seen PG mm-hmm. guard him. I've seen Beverly guard him. And like you said, he, he just gets by all of them. Yeah, people don't realize how big he is. Like, I mean, I guess the best example is well, actually when the he, game. With, yeah, we hugged. The Harold. Yeah. yeah. They were the same size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Same size. And, but he, everything about his game is deceptive. The look is deceptive. You know, even when he doesn't have the ball and he runs, he does not look like he's very athletic. He doesn't. Jump high. The first step isn't blazing. He's just, man, he's just amazing, man. It's just kind of scary to wonder, like, how much better he can get. It is scary. Uh, and you'll see two, three years down the line, he could be, or it's, uh, I mean, right now, it's it's pretty even money that he will be ending up as the best player in basketball in two, three years. I mean, that could very easily be said. I'm not saying that for sure. But that's a very great. So. It, that's a great possibility right there. I mean, LeBron will already be on on the you know closing in on forty. Anthony Davis will be right at at age thirty thirty one. Really, at that point in time, who is going to be there to be at that level? He is Zion. I, I don't think so. No. Well, even I mean, think about if they win this round, and they will play. I guess. The Lakers Blazers winner, is that correct? No, they would play no, no, they'll play the Utah. Yeah. We'll talk about that I, one in a sec. Imagine the numbers he would put up. Like he's putting up these ridiculous numbers against a team that was built to stop LeBron. They were built to handle, you know, LeBron's physicality. And, I mean, this team was just built to beat the Lakers. I think that's their main goal. Beat the Lakers, win a championship. Even if they beat the Lakers in, I don't know, the Western Conference Finals or something like that and lost in the Finals, it still would be an uber successful year for the Clippers. Talk, and, talk to me about the difference between those two because if you say that the the Clippers were built to beat LeBron and the Lakers, that means that – LeBron is somewhat different in styles and I see their styles and I see what they do for the teams. I see more similarities and differences in their game. Yeah, you know, I, I agree, but I just don't think that they expect it to mask the maps to be in there. You know what I'm saying? Like the team that takes them through that takes them out. And I, I guess it goes back to maybe the best comparison I can think of is Remember the Thunder were built to beat the Lakers. Yeah. That's why they traded Jeff Green for Kendrick Perkins and they got size and their main thing was if we got it, if we're going to get out the West, we have to have the guys to be able to defend Bynum and Gasol. And I just think that's what the Clippers thing was when they got the two good wing defenders, they felt like we can switch out on LeBron, we can make him work picking him up full court with Beverly. The same defense is they're running on Luka. Now, I will say that if Paul George was playing better and knocking down shots, you know, we could play the what-if game, it, it would be a different series. But he's he's been a liability for for the Clippers, and the Mavs are just kind of building off of it. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think if Dallas gets by this series and they move on to play Utah, I mean, Utah does have a great rim protector, but I think the Mavs have the shooters to get him out of the paint. And he may put up – him and Mitchell may have some 50-point duels. That would be something to see, my friend. That really would be something to see. The balls could be flying from the three-point area. That would be just yep. amazing to see. And Gobert would be probably the angriest man on the court because he would have to go either be – just be played entirely off the court 
or just have to go ahead and guard Porzingis out at the top because you know that's what Dallas would end up doing. Yeah, and I, I mean, that's why they avoided Houston is because Houston has knocked them out of the playoffs, I think, the last two years in a row. And it just kind of, you know, it was just a, a disadvantage because their defense is based off of funneling guys in the Rudy. But if you take him out and make him defend in space, then he just isn't as as dominant. So, man, I mean, the NBA playoffs so far since the restart between the bubble and the playoffs, man, it's been great. I don't think Adam Silver could have asked for a better situation. Well, let's hope it keeps going, my friend. Let's hope nobody, like you said, gets a little bit uh, mischievous and uh, starts doing things that they should regret. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, they will go ahead and continue this fine stroke of luck and be able to go ahead and, I guess, like you said, just keep on going and, and keep on making not only Adam Silver but the fans happy because we are getting a treat in all this, and I am enjoying it and seeing all this happen and this is something you and I had talked about because the fact that there is no home court and that there mm-hmm. is no road games, really. Some of these teams are thinking a different mindset here. Now, you know, we're going to talk about Philadelphia here in a minute, which unfortunately played all four games like they were playing on the road. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, it just seems like with Dallas, they have the mentality here. It's, an, it's a neutral court and we have every chance to win. And they're coming of age. I mean, the Mavs, like we talked about before, historically, it's the best offense ever based off offensive rating. But the one thing that they struggled at was closing games. And this was a game that they closed. I mean, I thought at, when I thought when it went to overtime, I thought, oh, man, this favors, this favors the Clippers. But they hung on and, you know, they're a young team and, you know, learning how to close games comes with experience. And if they made that jump from good team that can't close to now being able to close, they're, they're, they're a dangerous team. I don't think anybody wants to face them. No, no, not if they're, they're playing like they are playing. So <laughs> it is going to be something to see. And like we said, they could very easily have been up three to one and, and, if they end up still losing the series, it's probably going to go down to a six or seven game. Well, it has to go down to a six game now, but it could really mm-hmm. go down to a seven game series. And if that's the case for Zingas, a lot of eyes are going to be pointing on him, not only for missing today's game, but I think he should have really toughened it out, but also what doing what he did in game one. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things with the Mavs all year, when Luca didn't play, they still played well. I mean, they, it wasn't like they lost a lot of ground when he missed those games. And then when Porzingis wasn't playing, they still were able to play well. And it wasn't until like maybe, I want to say January maybe. It seems like it was so long ago, even though it was this season. Luca and and Porzingis started to really mesh. But that wasn't until Dwight Howard, I mean not Dwight Howard, Dwight Powell went down and they start playing Porzingis at the five, and then that's when their offensive rating jumped to historical numbers. But I think they've all year they've been able to play well with one of those guys being out. And so if they can ever like really get the chemistry going with those two, like I said, they're going to be dangerous. So we'll see. We will see. Even, even if uh, I guess last point, even if you notice like when Luca is out, they don't lose a lot of ground. Even in the series, like when he's on the bench, they still are able to just spread the floor with Trey Burke. He's able to get to the lane on straight line drives. And then Seth Curry is, I mean, he's shooting lights out. He didn't even, saw some... he didn't even what? He attempted one three. I think he missed it today. And he's actually uh, doing a great job. Like he's they're they're coming out at him for the three. Closing out hard, yeah. And that he's just going by him, faking it, going by him, and then shooting, you know, settling for the 20 footer. But like you said, this it's like a layup for him. Yeah. I saw a graphic where I guess it was from another time, and it was like he was at a game, and he was in, like, the, the luxury suite, and it had uh, Steph, but it was, like, Seth Curry's brother. <laughs> so, and it's usually the other way around. You know, yes. Seth is not Steph's brother. And so I thought that was pretty funny that, you know, here he is in the playoffs, and Steph is at home, which who would ever thought that? Whoever, and, yep. But he's actually statistically and, the better shooter this year, at least. 
Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, he was a blazer last year, so I feel like, man, we could have used him. But, uh, yeah, he's, I mean, he's putting on a shooting clinic. And I, I'm excited about the Mavs' future just because I live in Dallas and I feel like I've watched Luka grow up, like, before my eyes. So the future is bright. To, yeah, definitely, definitely scary for other teams. But, man, if I'm a Clippers fan, I'm I'm a little concerned. I'm really worried. Do you think they're going to pull it out, Dallas, or do you think it'd still be the Clippers at the end of the day? Well, I guess I shouldn't say if I'm a Clippers fan. I don't know if there are any Clippers fans. <laughs> so, but there no, are. I, there are. I know a few. A few. <laughs> um, we can talk about that. You know how they became fans because the seats were cheap. Yes. <laughs> so, but um. But no, I think right now with the momentum Dallas has and the confidence they're playing with, I think that is is very possible that they can win the series. I mean, we have to figure out what is wrong with Paul George. I think his shoulders are bothering him. He hasn't been aggressive. I don't know when he hurt it, if he hurt it, but I don't know. I mean, he just hasn't looked good since the since the playoffs started. I mean, I haven't seen the stats. Um, oh, I shouldn't say I haven't. I don't remember the stats off the top of my head, but it was like eleven points per game, like something, something crazy. And uh, so that's the difference. I mean, I don't think that should be forgot about. But I know social media is they get they're killing him on Twitter. You know Twitter, definitely yeah. know Twitter. But yeah, it's two to two as they head for another game on Tuesday. Very interested and intrigued to see how that goes. Hopefully the Dallas Mavericks will have Porzingis back. And for the Clippers fans out there, hopefully they will have Patrick Beverly back and and we'll get them both at full strength and see exactly which team is going to win out in this best of now three series going forward. This is Raphael from NBADraftJunkies.com and you are listening to the Lakers Fast Break. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmo Show and the PCC Multiverse. The better that these Marvel films do, the higher the standards are going to be for not just other films in general, but other Marvel films also. I think it's really hard to end a show with this many fans in a satisfying way. That's the Pop Culture Cosmo Show. And the PCC Multiverse. Playing worldwide on radio seven days a week and wherever you get your podcasts. Another game of interest, my friend. I'm going to go ahead and shoot off on the first team to go ahead and, as they say on TNT, go fishing. That would be the Philadelphia 76ers, who lost, again, 4-0. They got swept by Boston, so bring out the brooms, 110-106. to And this game, to me, again, just it seemed like Philadelphia, they were playing from behind uh, their third quarter – of that second half, they just came out with nothing. And they got killed in that third quarter by Boston. And that was pretty much all she wrote because by that time, you're so far down, you have to come from so far back. It, in the fourth quarter, it's just too little, too late. Yeah, they <laughs> – I mean, I'm kind of glad they're out. Their games are boring. <laughs> <You know? laughs> out of all the other – you know, like the – even though the Denver – Utah series is three one now. Yes, that's still been exciting. Uh, I think the Blazers Lakers series has been exciting. This Mavs series has been exciting. Even Houston has been more exciting. But this Boston Philadelphia series has just been just been an ugly East Coast basketball. Uh, I mean, I don't think anybody thinks Philly has a chance. They competed today. I will say that. I thought down 3-0 they were, you know, they pack it up and it would be a blowout. But they competed and, you know, the seat has to be hot, like we said, for Elton Brand and Brett Brown. Like the team is just terribly put together. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more on that. All those shooters that are now in different places that they could have had and, and the fact that they also could have had a dynamic player that could bail you out like Jimmy Butler when you get it in a pinch – it, to me, it just boggles my mind how they just managed to go ahead and mess that all up. And yep. I, yeah, I know the comment was made, I think, yesterday. Why didn't they keep Sam Hinkie? I'm kind of wondering that, too, after all this time, although we know why. 
because yeah, the you NBA. know, yeah, the huh. NBA didn't want to keep him there. But imagine if he had had that process completely filled out, you know, filled out, and where they would be at today. You know, maybe it wouldn't be as good, maybe it'd be worse, maybe a bit better, but at least it would be different than what you're seeing right now. And the future for Philadelphia is going to be rough because you have three hundred million dollars committed to two players that are not fulfilling their contract status right now. I mean, Tobias Harris and Al Horford just not getting it done to the point where they need to. Yeah, they're in salary cap hell. And then I also read that a report came out today that um, Butler, they wanted him to not take any visits in free agency. And since he did entertain other teams, they decided not to offer him a max deal. Now, I don't know how true that is, but it's like, you know, what's the purpose of free agency? Free agency, you're supposed to be able to, you know, find out the best situation for you and, you know, explore visiting other teams. And I guess if the report is true, they didn't want him to do that at all. And once he decided to do this, like maybe they felt betrayed and decided not to make him an offer which they could have, I don't know if they had his bird rights or not off the top of my head because he had played there before, but clearly he he didn't want to be there. So I don't think it would have made much of a difference. But if that's true that they were being that petty, then, you know, they got some issues up top. Oh, that they do, my friend. I think Doris Burke, she was roasting in that fourth quarter the Sixers management. Like I think she made something to the effect of a comment: "It's it's there's issues there from the top down," and uh, she was, uh, you know, like I said, taking rightful shots at the uh, organization because when you get swept in the first round, especially after there were such high expectations going into it, I actually had the team slotted a lot higher at the beginning of the year than what they ended up doing. So I'm I'm just as much as guilty and by, of buying into it as far as what they, I thought their team could do. But, uh, you know, it, right now it looks like uh, that there's going to be a lot of changes that need to be made. Would you, at this point in time, try to break up the big two of Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons? Joel Embiid did not look happy, and there might be some dissension there in the ranks going forward. Yeah, I don't know which one is going to go. I think the people of Philadelphia like Embiid more. I think that at this point, they both have injury issues and concerns. They would be red flagged on, you know, if they had to take a a physical for another team. Uh, But I don't know if you can work with them together just because of the way the roster has been built. And with Horford being there, Embiid is always going to face double teams. He's not going to get clean looks in the post because, you know, the defense is going to be sitting in his lap. He needs to be paired with a stretch knockdown four and a point guard that can put him in pick and rolls that the defenses respect. I mean, if Ben Simmons tries to run a pick and roll, they're just going to drop back and they know he's not going to shoot. I think Ben Simmons is – A phenomenal talent, but I'm kind of hard on him because I feel like, all right, you got this generational talent in Joel Embiid. All you have to do is work on your weakness to make everyone better. And he seems like he refuses to work on the one thing that he's not good at. I think that This is just my opinion. I think he is a guy that is supremely naturally talented and everything has came easy to him. And the shooting is something that he's going to have to work at. And because it doesn't come easy to him, he just doesn't want to do it. And he wants a team to be built around his strength and instead of just working on his weakness. I mean, I think jump shooting is one of the easiest things to fix. But he, it's been like, it's 2020, he was drafted in 2016. It's been four years, and he hasn't made any effort to, like, work on his shot. So if the team is broken up, I don't know who you would choose because it would be hard for me as a general manager to build my team around a guy who doesn't want to make 
and effort to improve his game to make the overall team better. So I agree with him. But I, I read that the reason why Elton Brand had the job is because other teams or other like top general manager prospects knew that they were going to have to break up those two and nobody wanted to be the one that had to make a decision between those two. So if that, if those rumors were true, it, it totally makes sense now. Well, I think that's a very real possibility. And I think ultimately one of those two is going to have to, to depart Philadelphia. And you're right. Philadelphia, they love Joel Embiid more. He seems to have become more, uh, I guess, uh, acclimated with the 76ers fans. 76ers fans are kind of hard on Ben Simmons, but I mean, the, as a playmaking and defensive talent, he's really hard to go ahead and, and pass up. But you're right, that mm-hmm. jump shot. Oh my gosh, he's got to. Yeah. Well, we keep saying for years now he's got to work on it, so he knows what he needs to do. And if he doesn't do it, there you go. Uh, I will say who, right. Who would you choose between? If you were, if you had to choose, who's your choice? I would keep Ben, personally. You keep Ben. I would keep Ben. See, I think it's tough because if he's your best player in the fourth quarter in a close game, you know, you got your franchise guy who you can't depend on because he doesn't want to be fouled. And then if he plays off the ball, he just kind of hides in the dunker spot. And I think it will be hard to build around him unless you surround him with great shooters. But in those close games, I think he's going to be like a poor man's Giannis. He doesn't have, he's not as aggressive as Giannis, but I think in this playoffs, especially when they play Miami, who it looks like they're going to play, or is it official yet? What? Oh, no, no Miami, no, I think it's still till three to three up, three zero. Yeah, so I think they're going to face each other, but I think Giannis gets exposed by the Heat because they're so used to winning and blowouts, but their offense and their team isn't built to come back if they're down because they don't have uh, their best player is not really good at getting his own shot in a half-court situation. Well, if Embiid can't get you those shooters, then you really need to be looking for another GM position because Embiid should have enough talent and skill because he is an MVP top five player candidate if he played to his full potential each and every night. Mm-hmm. But you and I both know he doesn't. So to me... I think it's hard for him well, it because is, there's no space no spacing, but I don't also don't like the fact his commitment and con- to conditioning to the things yep. that he needs to focus on. He gets easily distracted by either on, on the court or off the court stuff. And the fact that he wants to, like a lot of these big men who have a decent touch, want to shoot excessively from the outside, especially for him is to a detriment because he could go down low and just kill absolutely everybody. Well, I, I remember reading him saying that the reason why he's shooting so many jumpers is because he can't get post touches. And if I'm a coach, especially in the playoffs when they play a good team, if Ben Simmons passes the ball and he doesn't go back to get it, where is he at? And so he's not going to stand at the three-point line because if he does stand at the three-point line, the man that's guarding him is going to be in Embiid's lap. And if, I mean, so it's like when he doesn't have the ball, he really makes it difficult for everybody around him because he's not a threat. He doesn't cut. He doesn't post up. And so I can see why there's times where Joel has to shoot a jump shot because he's the one that is trying to space the floor. And then when you have him on the court with Horford and Simmons, I mean, Horford can knock down shots, but, you know, he's... He's still in the area, and I just think that just kills Philadelphia's offense. But, but you can get more for Embiid than you can for Simmons. Yeah, and, and ultimately, well, that's that. W- I would think you can, uh, you know, with with mm-hmm. Embiid. I, I would think you would honestly would get more for a little bit more for Embiid. We're, we're, I mean, we're talking semantics here, but for me, I think you would just get a little bit more for Embiid, and that ultimately is the reason for me saying I would choose on one or the over the other, but. Yeah. Again, for me, a lot of it goes also as well defense, perimeter defense, and the wing defense that Ben Simmons can play. Because when you know he's on the court, he can play elite level wing defense. Yeah, and I, I think in this era where shooting and scoring is so important, having an elite defender that 
brings nothing on offense in the half court, I think it equals each other out because like I said, half court game, if he doesn't have the ball in his hands, where is his defender at? You put size on him. Like if you put a long guy like Siakam on him, now Siakam has the length and the athleticism to be able to kind of play free safety. Imagine like playing the Lakers and Anthony Davis doesn't have to guard anybody. He's going to absolutely and destroy your offense because he's going to be able to go from sideline to sideline, trap to pick and roll, get back block shots. And I think, I mean, not every team has an AD, so I won't even make it seem like he's he can be duplicated. But I, I just think like a guy like Simmons that doesn't bring anything in a half court on the offensive end can easily hurt his team, even though he's, you know, doing such a good job on defense. And may I ask as well, the contract status, I think of the two, Embiid has the, I think, more attractive contract status, or am I mistaken? Yeah, I think Embiid is like 150, and Ben's may have been like 170. Yeah, so, I I mean, again, it's all about semantics. You're still going to get a lot (laughs) for either, but I think they do need to be broken up, I think, at this point. I think it just, uh, at this point, you need to make a commitment on, on keeping one or the other because I don't think it's going to work out anytime soon. At least not yeah. to the level that they want it to. No, I don't I don't think it's going to work out. I think you know this off season we're really going to find out if they like each other or not. I think somebody's going to demand to be out. And I wouldn't be shocked if if Ben Simmons said he wanted to be out, I wouldn't be shocked at all. If it was Embiid, I wouldn't be shocked either. I just don't know, like, what teams would I, – I just don't know how it would be beneficial to Philly in a sense because even though they're going to get different players for them, you still have those guys making all of that money, and then you're going to have to take on some some contracts also to make the deal work. So I think they're in, they're in a crazy situation. That they are, my friend, but this is a situation that they put themselves in, so they've got yeah. no one else to blame. Well, I want to ask you this, my friend, before we head on out, we've got two more games to cover. We've uh, spent quite a deal of time on these two other two other games with Philadelphia being swept by Boston and also as well Dallas with the great victory over the Los Angeles Clippers. You also had on the slate another close game in the Western Conference, and that was the Denver Nuggets and the Utah Jazz with Utah pulling out the two point victory. And my gosh. That was a duel between two guards, you know, as far as between Mitchell and Murray, both of them over the 50-point mark. That's, again, if you got a chance to see the game, you were you were in for a treat. And this is an under-the-radar series, I think, to a lot of people. But to NBA fans, they're really looking at this 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 whole series. I'm sure some are surprised the way it's turned out with Utah now having a 3-1 to one series lead. But again, it could easily, within a couple of days' time, turn right back around. Yeah, I think I had Denver in seven, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was the pick I had, and I, I didn't think Conley would um, be back. And, but I guess you know it's kind of easy to forget that the break that they had is really like as long as an off season. So it's kind of like a totally different season, you know, and. It's almost like Conley came back and had a fresh new start this year. So he's playing well. Denver just has – well, we knew that they weren't a great defensive team. But I one of the things I like about Utah and Quinn Snyder is if he sees a defensive liability on the court, he is going to attack, attack, attack. And I remember 2018 when they played the Thunder, whenever Carmelo Anthony was on the court – they just attacked him with Donovan Mitchell every single play. And it got to the point where Billy Donovan couldn't play Mello, which caused friction because Mello said he's not coming off the bench. And it personally, I think it led to Mello being booted out of OKC because he wasn't going to accept the role. And the team played better with Grant on the court, who ironically now plays for Denver. Well, This time, Snyder's target is Michael Porter Jr. 
he is going at him. It's like when he got in the game, they just literally ran plays to get him matched up against Donovan Mitchell. Straight line drives. Helps out. You know, the defense comes to help. Kicks out for a three. I think there was one play when he got in. It was three straight possessions. First possession was a he drove to Lane. He got help. Kicked it out to Georges. Georges made a three. Second possession, layup. Next possession, and one. It was three straight possessions, like eight points. And now we understand why Malone decided not to play Porter Jr. because they're going to attack, attack, attack. I mean, Mitchell's going to get his points, but he was the weak link that they decided to attack. Um, remember when you played Mortal Kombat? So when I played Mortal Kombat, I used to, I couldn't do all the moves. I used to be the guy that just trips. And, you know, remember, like, if you trip somebody, as soon as they got up, you trip them over and over again. That was yep. my move. Like, I, I didn't do anything else. I think my guy was Jax. I just tripped whoever over and over again. <laughs> it was just like and, me, just like me in Street Fighter with Blanca. I would just get, I would just push somebody into a corner and just headbutt him, headbutt him, over headbutt over, over, over and yeah. over, over until I, I've won the, <laughs> until I won the match. And that's Snyder's offense when certain guys are on the floor. You just get that mismatch and you just attack it over, 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 over again. And it's made Malone adjust. I mean, MPJ, MP, MPJ is their third option on offense. Yeah. But then once you make him unplayable, you kind of mess up Denver's flow, even though Denver's still going to score a lot of points regardless. But they limited his minutes because they were just attacking him. So I think this series is – I think it's over. I just don't think Denver has a, an answer for Mitchell. I mean, this is two 50-point games. Yep. He's 50, getting to the paint. He's knocking down free throws. 57 Kyle's and 51. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I, and then the other game that he had a low scoring game, which he had 20, that they was blew them out. Yeah. So, yep. I'll tell so, you, yeah, I don't think Denver has an answer. I think this series is over. I, I think this series is, I think I'm going to give Denver one more game. I think I'm going to give them one more game. But Content Creators 805 is back. Hey, how you doing, my friend? Great to have you back watching us. Uh, Toronto or Boston? We'll get to that in a sec. He wants to know in that series who's who you have because Toronto and Boston is now set, my friend. Because Toronto, my gosh, talking about scoring about points, they scored some points in today because they beat Brooklyn. They finally dusted them off and swept them away. 150. Uh, and you're right, yes, Mitchell is in the zone. Uh, I couldn't agree with you more content creators. But they won 150 to 122 over Brooklyn and just cruised this entire series. I mean, if any team dominated the entire way, it was Toronto. They just, Brooklyn never had a chance, which I know was kind of surprising to me and also surprising to you because I, I don't think they just, I thought they were going to put up much more of a fight than what they did. Yeah, just talent and experience. I mean, you look at the Nets roster what was that thing they used to have on tnt who he played for yeah. <laughs> that's their entire roster and then in that fourth quarter of the game man i had to pull out the my phone and see like who's this guy so yeah the nets were scrambling for players but they played hard i mean i, I didn't expect i didn't expect them to really you know challenge the raptors i thought they'd be competitive and they were going to fight and be scrappy and play hard because they got a bunch of guys that are fighting for their careers and, and they're kind of auditioning for other teams as opposed to playing to win something, a game. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Toronto looks good. I guess we'll find out if Lowry's injury is pretty serious or not. I know he left the game and then I said he even left the, the arena. So hopefully it's not too serious. I would like to see both teams, at full strength, even though we know Boston won't be with Hayward out, but close to full strength as possible. I think it's going to be a great series. I haven't thought about who I would pick at this point. Man, that's a tough one. Yep. That is that is a, a tough, a really tough one. Two respected coaches, two guys that are just kind of known for just getting the best out of their guys. Um, hmm. I'll save my prediction for game one, for right before game one. Oh, man. Content creators, 805, <laughs> letting them down. 
I'm going to go ahead on the limb, my friend. I'll give you, I'll give you my thoughts. And I think right now it comes down to can Jason Tatum play at that level? Uh, I yeah. think seven. I think you're right. Content creators zero five. I think it's going to go seven, but I think I'm going to give Toronto the pass on this. I think they're going to go ahead and provide just enough defense on Jason Tatum to get on by because Jason Tatum has to play at a superhero like level in my opinion in order to go ahead and get get by I mean obviously you have Kimball Walker there now playing pretty steady so he looks mm-hmm. he looks healthy the knee looks pretty good so I, I'm still thinking at this point in time even with Hayward out that Tatum and Brown have to be the key I think for the series because you're going to get a concerted together effort from Toronto with or without Lowry. And I think who's better, Siakam or Tatum? I think Tatum. I think Tatum has the higher upside. As much as Siakam has improved, for me, I think it's Tatum. Who do you got? That's tough. I mean, I think it's easy to say Tatum because he's kind of like been in front of our eyes longer. You know, he went to Duke. He came in with the pedigree and he's playing like how you expected him to. And he's, he has improved a lot. But Siakam has made, I mean, he's come out of nowhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, most improved player two years in a row, I think. Two I'll... years in a row. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's easy to say Tatum because he has the better-looking offensive game. Like, Siakam's game is still kind of awkward and, and ugly, and it's not as smooth or as, as, as marketable. Like, who's paying to watch Pascal Siakam play. <laughs> so, and, and Siakam's defense is better than Tatum's. Yeah. yeah. But I just think yeah, I, just, I just think with Siakam, it's it that team in Toronto does not look for him to be the man all the time. Whereas in Boston, there's more and more often times where Boston is looking at Tatum to be that individual. Yeah, I think Boston does kind of fall in love with ISO ball sometimes. While that Toronto team is ball is just whipping around. You don't, I mean, you know, statistically Siakam's going to, I think he has like 25 a game this year. At one yeah. point he may have been, um, but it's not a 25 where you're like, man, I want to go out to the, you know, a kid is going to go out to the court. So I want to be like Siakam, <laughs> you know? So it's just not like visually pleasing in a sense. Um, but I don't know. I mean, as far as the prediction, I'll wait until I hear about what happened with Lowry. Yeah. Before I before I go on a limb, but I might be leaning towards Toronto because Boston has had issues with size, and I think uh, yeah, I just think that the Raptors have the size that can kind of hurt Boston because Boston just doesn't really have size at center. I think Tice maybe like six eight two forty. Yes. And he's undersized, and then he doesn't really make you pay for him being undersized with great outside shooting. And Gasol is just so smart there, so I think Gasol might be the real difference maker in the series. Well, Toronto's offense is clicking like it is right now. Watch out, man! Watch out, Nick Nurse, man. I remember him in the G League, and he was an awesome coach in the G League. Like his teams were always competitive, always something. Crazy. I mean, he he's just so confident in his coaching, and he's not afraid to try different things. Man, he'll throw out a boxing one. He'll throw out a gimmick defense. He, I mean, he's just a very good coach. And so, yeah, I, I think I'm going to lean towards Toronto. And one of the things I think was said best, I heard earlier today, was Amin El Hassan, one of the guys that I respect the most as far as voices on the NBA. Former and it hasn't got a haircut all yeah. year. Yeah, no. I know. <laughs> but he likes Star Wars, so I'm actually going to give yeah. him a lot of props for that. But he said that Toronto is one of the few teams that makes a defensive game plan different every single game, not just basic defensive sets. They make a, a defense that's catered to each specific team every time they match up against a new team. So. I'm I'm like I said I think right now this is no longer a fluke this is no longer a oh well you know it's a nice story and all that they are a viable contender for the NBA title if you didn't think that if you didn't think if you didn't think so before you're going to have to think it now because they are just so good right now at as a team as a unit 
but Lowry, Lowry's injury could be a key factor there as well. Yeah, imagine if the Clippers go out in the first round and Toronto advances. <laughs> imagine that. Good thing Kawhi doesn't have Twitter. <laughs> yeah, uh, imagine that. And, I mean, it wouldn't even really be his fault if the Clippers lose because he's playing out of his mind. Yeah. He is looking – this is the best I've seen him play as far as just his health and how he's moving around. And man, that would be tough for him to waste like perfect health on a, a first round exit. But yeah, I mean, that would be definitely the talk of social media. If the Clippers get bounced and Toronto advances. And I, I saw a tweet where somebody said, all Kawhi had to do was stay. He could have been the prime minister of Canada <laughs> if he stayed, but he wanted to go home. He wanted to go home indeed. But that's how it stands right now with Toronto sweeping, also as well Boston sweeping, and a tie right now, 2-2, two to two, between the Clippers and the Dallas Mavericks. And Utah is on the verge of moving into the second round with a 3-1 to one lead over Denver. A very interesting day in the NBA playoffs. Also, if everyone gets a chance to check out what we did earlier today as a group with our NBA mock draft on Rafael Barlow's site, NBA Draft Junkies, please do so. But before we head on out, Rafael, because I know it's late for you already, please give everyone an update of what you got coming out this week at NBA Draft Junkies. Yeah, this is my favorite time of the year for the website. And uh, I, I almost feel like it should be like Christmas music at some point. You know, just yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it. Like it's you know all the work that I've put in or anybody that's doing draft stuff. Like I started in September and, you know, started compiling scouting reports and lists. And, you know, there's sometimes I'll put up a list or a scouting report on a player and nobody's really watching it, but just knowing that not being discouraged by the views or lack thereof, but knowing that all of a sudden after the lottery, everybody starts kind of paying more attention to the draft. So, I'm just excited about that. Um, I'm just kind of seeing, like, like I said, all the work that I've put in since, like, September, finally, like, you know, really coming together. And then um, I'll do a mock draft 2.0. So the first one I did was it's, – it's been successful. I think it's at over, like, 12,000 views in the last 24 hours. And then um, I'll do the second half because the first half was just the lottery. So I did picks 15 to 30. I already have my list made. I just need to record it. Then I have a few player profiles like Devin Vassell that I need to upload. And uh, I'm updating the site daily as far as like the profiles and just updating my site. So I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. You know, sometimes I may get up at like six o'clock in the morning, start working on it and realize, Oh man, it's two o'clock. I haven't ate yet. So, and you know, it's just kind of like, motivational when you see like your hard work like being recognized so part of it is you know I, I thank you because I had someone reach out to me and they said that they started following my site because they saw it or heard about it on the Lakers fast break podcast so stuff like that just kind of pushes you when you're tired to keep going so yeah NBA Draft Junkies the site is updated YouTube channel I put out new content almost every day I'm going to just say at least five days out the week, I have something new up on the site. So keep checking it out, and, and you'll you'll see all the work that I've been putting in. And for me at the Lakers Fast Break, we're going to continue our coverage of the NBA playoffs. I'll get to your question in a sec before we head on out, content creators, 805, count on it. But I'm going to go ahead and tell everybody each and every day this week, or each and every day there's playoffs this week, because a lot of these series are already ending already. Uh, Raphael and I are going to be on each and every day with an episode. If you can't catch us live on video on Facebook Live or YouTube, you can always catch us at the Lakers Fast Break channel wherever you get your podcasts. Plus, if you listen to Pop Culture, I've got a great episode of the Pop Culture Cosmos dropping on worldwide radio stations and also as well on podcast outlets everywhere where we talk wall-to-wall -wall DC and so much more with the DC fandom that happened this weekend. We recap it in full. I've also got another great show coming up on Friday for that. Got two RPGs for live video coming up on Monday and Tuesday and some more great interviews coming up as well. So a busy week on schedule for both of us, whether it's the Lakers Fast Break, Pop Culture Cosmos, Rafael Barlow with all the great stuff, he's NBA Draft Junkies, 
Lakerholics.com if you haven't stopped by and checked it out already. You see all the great stuff there from Laker Tom and and also as well you've got Magic Man and of course you've got some great things going on there as well. Jamie Sweet has got another great article with five great things. We're signaling the ref for a quick timeout, but we'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Hey, Lakers fans. Looking for the best place to go for up-to-date news, information, original videos, articles, podcasts, opinion pieces, and discussions about the Los Angeles Lakers? Well, look no further than Lakerholics.com. With a legion of followers always there talking about everything Lakers and the NBA, there's no better place to go to share your fandom as the team heads toward another championship run. So stop by and be part of the conversation today at Lakerholics.com. So before we head on out, my friend, I'm not going to avoid it anymore. Who you guys got tomorrow? Let's go ahead through the games. Let's go through all the games, not just the one you and I have the uh, pleasure of talking about the most. But let's take a look at the schedule we've got for tomorrow. I've got NBA.com up for those on Facebook Live. So for tomorrow... Uh, what we get, what we have here is, of course, Milwaukee and Orlando. I Over. see, yeah, and that again. As I, I said, I don't want to get, I don't pull that joke out three times in a row where it's oh so cute and all that. So I'll just say it is over. I think Orlando is uh, a done, pretty much done ski at this point in time. Um, I also Houston and Oklahoma. Now this is kind of interesting because Oklahoma they escaped with their victory in overtime on a fact that. You know, you know, House couldn't make the free throw, to, you know, during regulation. So it's very interesting. Do you believe that this could bring Oklahoma City back into the series? Uh, I'm going Houston. I think Houston will win. I do think Oklahoma has found something in Lugans Dort as far as matching him up with Harden. I think that uh, Harden had a, a great game, but he worked. He worked hard for all his points. And their supporting cast didn't really shoot lights out. But I think Oklahoma I think Oklahoma won their only game for the series. I got Houston winning tomorrow. I've got Houston winning tomorrow as well. And then also Indiana and Miami. Is it a clean sweep for Miami? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's just down three oh. it's it's I mean, I would love to see like the percentages of teams that are down three zero and they come back and win game four. Um, but no, I think Miami wins. It's uh, our, so that would be what three of the teams in the East that mm-hmm. are sweep. So the East might they could be done by Wednesday. Yep. And then the West could. I mean, <laughs> yeah, that could I'm go curious. on through the weekend. Yeah, so are they going to start round two in the East before? I think they will. The West finishes. I think so. I think. I mean, I guess for TV purposes, then they, it would make some sense. But just think, they need to give these guys a rest. They've been playing every other day. It's all about TV. Yeah. It's all about TV. Close game, close out games are hard sometimes. I agree with you, content creators eight or five. But if Indiana has a chance, TJ Warren has got to have the big numbers like he did earlier in the bubble, I think, in order to go ahead for Indiana to take a game on Miami. Yeah. I mean, he just doesn't seem to have that same foot speed or just the same burst that yeah. he – I mean, he he was knocking down threes. Also, I just think teams have kind of had a chance to scout and prepare for him at the four a little bit more. Agree with you on that one, and like you said, uh, in, it's all about matchups, and it's all about you get to see a lot of video on these guys and how they match up against you over the course of a series. And T.J. Warren has to, in my opinion, for them to have a chance, but I don't think they won't have. I don't think they'll make it, and I think Miami will move on to the next round. Content creators eight hundred five says the Bucks will sweep out from here, so they'll win four one. He thinks. I think that's obviously. Uh, I think. I think at this point in time, looks like it, it's going to be that. And he thinks, well, he thinks Indiana can get the game tomorrow. So there you go. And he also thinks OKC will win tomorrow. So he's got a couple of the upsets. So 
Hopefully you'll be on with us tomorrow night watching uh, watching the show so we can say, hey, you know, you were right, content creators at five, because you were right, I think, at least a couple times uh, over us, uh, I think, during the course of last week. So I got to give you your props on the air, my friend. So hopefully you'll be get a chance to see that, or at least on one of our outlets after the fact. But okay, before we head on out, let's go ahead and do it. I know who you're going to pick. And you know who I'm going to pick, but we'll go through the motion anyways. L.A. versus Portland tomorrow. Blazers by six. The uh, Mavs game, let me know that it's, it's possible. It's possible. I think, uh, yeah, I think Blazers and, and, and six. Just got to get Melo to understand, man, do not come inside the three-point line. Well, I still Study uh, Anthony Tolliver film. Study Channing Fry. <laughs> Robert Ori, whatever you do, do not come inside the three-point line. You're not going to be efficient posting up LeBron, the Morris twin, or Anthony Davis. No isolation pull-ups. Stay outside the three-point line. We're going to tell you right now, my friend. You just got to get in shape. Got to get in shape, but he's also got to get some some more rest. Uh, They've got – Terry Stotts has got to give him a bigger blow. A uh, bigger break, you know, on the sidelines. It's got to give him some more rest. Can't afford to? I don't know how we can afford to. You take him out, and then you play. I mean, if you play Whiteside and Gabriel, or Whiteside and Herzonia, then we got to knock down shots to make offset them playing Davis and Dwight or Dwight. I mean, it's tough with with, with no depth. I mean. The the Lakers could shoot terribly from three, but if we go too small every time they shoot, the White's gonna get the rebound and these tap outs. Like they keep killing us with these tap outs. And Caruso always retrieves the tap outs. Always. Well that's his thing, my friend. That's his thing. Hustle, hustle, that's hustle. Uh, no, com- but if Rondo plays, we win by ten. Uh, if Rondo plays, you might win by 20. But anyways, content creators, 805, Lakers by five tomorrow, but he thinks the Blazers will come back and win game five. I'm picking the Lakers by by nine tomorrow. I think they'll just, it'll be similar to what we see, uh, what we saw in the last game where it, it's just, just not enough. The, the That Portland will just not have enough, uh, maybe fatigue in the fourth quarter one more time because it is every other day, every other day over and over again. It all depends on if they can stay hot, i.e. McCollum and Lillard. If they can stay hot in the second half, um, all bets are off. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. And you can see them explode for 30 and 40 each. And you know what? The Lakers will only have themselves to blame. But I'm thinking I'm picking the Lakers tomorrow. I'm picking the Lakers tomorrow to go up 3-1 in the series, and, and we'll go from there. But I expected the, the series to go 6 with the Lakers, so... Could be here. Could be tied up too, too. So we'll wait and see. Again, we're going to have everybody back tomorrow. Hopefully you, Laker Tom, he's going to probably rip my pick even more than I picked today. So, you know, whatever. Uh, then you have maybe Sean Grice, maybe Jamie Sweet as well. But it is going to be an interesting uh, conversation we're going to have tomorrow night. Hopefully everybody will be a part of it. And that is going to be NBA Playoffs Day 8. Looking forward to all the games tomorrow, especially the Lakers and Blazers. Want to go ahead and give us a shout out during that time. Or if you have a question, please, if you're not here live, if you're listening to us, send it out to us at Barlow 500 at NBA Draft Junkies or right here at Lakers Fast Break. Well, my friend, it's been great talking to you as always. Can't believe you put up with me for this long each and every day. But I truly appreciate it. You're very patient with me, so I just cannot thank you enough for sticking around. And I think it's been a great idea, you and I doing this every day. Yeah, I enjoy it. I, I enjoy it a lot. So I, um, yeah, I'm just looking forward to doing this. I mean, we can. I can commit to coming on until the last buzzer of the NBA Finals. So count me in. Count me in as well, indeed. Once again, it's Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies. Please. Go to his site, all the great stuff that's there. If you have a team that's not even the Lakers that you want to know more about in the NBA draft and some prospects out there that could be available for your team, there is absolutely no better place to go than NBA Draft Junkies. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. It is truly a pleasure being on the show, talking at you once again, talking playoffs right here at the Lakers Fast Break.